good morning. morning. Wonderful to see everybody this morning. Hope you're having a a wonderful weekend. And if you're in the working force still, I hope you get tomorrow off. It's a great uh, Memorial Day weekend that we're experiencing. A couple things. Uh, Thank you, Penny, for sharing. Got the food bank. I'm always uh, very... uh, Humbled yet excited when um, we uh, are able to talk to uh, many of our uh, folk in our neighborhood that need something to eat. And um, as we, of course, share the love of Christ with them, it's um, always wonderful to be able to share with them, you know, if you're hungry, if you need something to eat, we have a ministry that's provided for you. And I always am able to tell them about the food bank, and as long as we've been doing it, many are still uh, joyfully surprised that we have something. They don't realize it, so we need to continue to get that uh, to get that word out. So thank you for for leading that ministry. I know many are a part of that. Uh, second, next week's an exciting Sunday. It's the Lord's Day, of course. Uh, Tony in our nine thirty service. Tony's going to be baptized at nine thirty. So, 937. <laughs> and so, uh, spread the word uh, during this week. If uh, maybe you've been uh, sharing uh, the good news with somebody and, and you know, you sense that maybe they um, are thinking about uh, taking that next step and asking Christ uh, to be their Lord and want to follow him in baptism, have them give me a call. I'll be glad to meet with them and talk to them further about it and they're welcome to join us um, for baptism next Sunday as well. So I hope that happens um, next week. We have even more than Tony. We're so excited that Tony's going to be taking this step. And he says he's inviting a lot of folk to come, or that's what Sandy said. So you invite a lot of folk as well. <clears throat> also, of course, this is Memorial Day. Um, and we'll, we'll also be able to recognize Memorial Day, and, and really uh, the meaning of tomorrow for many, many people is uh, it's a holiday for a lot of Americans, but for many, they remember those that have been lost uh, due to war and being in our military. And I bet many people here uh, I know have served in the military. You may think of friends and, and, and uh, fellow soldiers and, and that have lost their lives through the years, too. So we, we do want to remember this time when it's one time that that Christians and state come together because, you know, who who better can we offer than the Spirit of God to help comfort these families at a time like this? And so we do want to remember each and every one. Let's We're going to take just a moment of silence for Memorial Day for those who have given their life. And as we do that, before we do that, if you're active military or veteran, Please stand now while we have a moment of silence. I know we have some here. Yes, thank you. Thank you for your service, and, and uh, thank you. Stay standing, Chuck, while we have this moment of silence. Because I know, I know that you, you men probably have friends and people, families that you're thinking of right now, and we want to honor them. Let's take a moment, and I'll close us in prayer. God, in these moments of silence, we're reminded that um, you give us so much joy in life and you introduce us to such wonderful people, even beyond our family, that become close to us, uh, comrades, friends, and, and those like these men that are standing have been in the service and uh, they, they develop close friendships, uh, they develop a, a close bond and love for other men and women that uh, that are in, in, in their same core with them. And Lord, um, we know that, um, that unfortunately until you come back, there is war and there's rumor of war. And so I just pray for, for these men and those that friends that they're thinking of now that they've lost uh, due to, to combat um, and other accidents and tragedies that come with serving our country. Lord, I think of others in our congregation who who are not in the military, but just may have memories of, of uh, family and loved ones who have fallen. So, Lord, um, we who have the answer 
for eternal life, we ask that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, fall upon every family this weekend and give them comfort and give them peace. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. <clears throat> well, in our passage today, um, let me start by saying I, I hear, I've heard some statements like this about, <clears throat> about believers that have gone on to do great things uh, or are really on fire for the Lord, and maybe you have too. Um, sometimes we might hear something like, well, you know, Jane, she was never able to speak in front of people before at all, but now uh, she can. She's leading a small group. Uh, she's, you know, she's uh, sharing a testimony in church. I didn't think she could ever do that. You know, I know Jack, he was a homebody. He never wanted to leave home much, even to go on vacation, much less. I can't believe that he just went for two weeks to a foreign country to do missions and to share Christ. Or I can't believe that so-and-so that I knew in childhood or growing up with is now such a believer and they're so on fire with their faith that they're sharing their faith with others. What a turnaround. I can't believe that that has happened. Sometimes it's hard for us to believe that uh, what people that God chooses to be leaders and to be his followers can do for the kingdom. It's amazing how the Spirit can change us. But the reality is, is that, that if you are a child of God and you've received the gift of salvation in Jesus Christ, He has chosen you. He's chosen you. You've been chosen by God for a special task and in some way uh, you need to discover that God has a very unique purpose for you. Now, overall, it's the same purpose. God wants to fulfill His great commission in your life, and He wants to, um, to help you make a difference in His kingdom. Now, Mark's gospel that Penny read to you comes to a point in, in Mark's drama where Jesus goes to the top of the mountain. Another gospel says he prays all night. And then he selects the people who will be his disciples. These will be those who will be responsible for carrying the message of salvation once he is gone and resurrected in the spirit to the rest of the world. We call these men disciples. Later they'll be called apostles. Apostles are those who are sent, the sent out ones. And it means that, that they were chosen by Jesus to be sent out in his name. Now, who were, at this time, these men who would be given this important mission? As we learn a little bit about these 12 disciples this morning, think about what I first said, that amazingly, these are the guys entrusted with spreading the good news, and setting the world on fire about Jesus in a world that knew nothing about him. Well, let's look at these guys. First of all, the inner circle. The, the first four disciples named were the four who were always very close to Jesus and whom Jesus took aside on several occasions away from the others to do deeper teaching and to let them experience things that nobody else would ever see. First of all, we have Simon. Simon, who later was called Peter. Simon means fluttering dove, and Peter means rock. And Peter is the man who became what Jesus declared him to be. He was impulsive, quick-tempered, spontaneous, Peter was emotional, uh, courageous at times, and cowardly at other times. Simon would, uh, would join a revolution at a moment's notice. But like many of us, he could not 
keep all the promises that he made. He uses words in the gospel freely like never and always. Many times we get in trouble when we use just those words, don't we? Peter meant well, but under pressure, he would even deny his Lord. We saw him weeping at the crucifixion, watching the sacrifice of Jesus, whom he loved so much. And, and then we see him meeting Jesus on the beach in order to be set free by Christ's forgiveness for a sin that's really, he felt, was beyond excuse of denying his Lord three times. Simon Peter often falls in his journey, as we do, but inevitably he manages to recover his courage and to recover his integrity. And Peter was certainly not very rock-like most of the time in the Gospels, but after he receives the forgiveness of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, he becomes so rock-like to the point where he could stand up and preach with boldness to thousands of people on Pentecost and see two or 3,000 of them come to know the Lord. Peter would eventually die the same death as Jesus. He was changed immeasurably. There was James and John, uh, brothers and, and the sons of Zebedee. Jesus knew his cousins well because he names them the sons of thunder. And they weren't named that because they received the most well-behaved award in Sunday school every year, were they? They were sons of thunder. In the Gospels, they're, they're very impatient young men who wanted immediate results. They, they spoke before they thought, as, as in the time they just wanted Jesus to rain down fire on a Samaritan village because that village wouldn't listen to Jesus. Jesus just called down a fire on, on that village and destroy them all. They were ambitious. They, they wanted to climb the administrative ladder in Christ's kingdom, and they requested of Jesus that that each of them would sit on either hand of him when he came into his kingdom. Jesus takes the opportunity at that point to teach them about servanthood and, and then tells them that uh, they would, but they would drink in the end from the same cup he did. What become or became of these important sons of thunder? Well, James becomes the leader of the Christian Jerusalem church, was the first leader of that movement. And also, he was the first of the disciples of the twelve to die and be martyred for his faith. John, the disciple that Jesus loved, turns from an angry young prophet to an author of love and a person so close in his walk with Jesus that that Christ gives him a glimpse of heaven and future glory of the Lord on the island of Patmos, which he writes down in Revelation. The fourth of the first group is Andrew. Uh, Andrew means manly. Andrew was a follower of John the Baptist, but he saw God in Jesus Christ, and, and, and he believes you see, there's, Andrew teaches us there's a difference in hearing the word of God and having a real encounter with Christ. He immediately brings Peter and Philip to Jesus. And he does this in a very quiet way by simply sharing what he's discovered. He had been changed through repentance and had found the Messiah he had longed for. And, and he was open to the new revelation, and he, Andrew was very pliable and very teachable. And when he discovered something that would change people's lives for the better, he would share it with them and share it with everyone. I think Andrew was probably the gospel's first evangelist. He was open with everyone, and he saw in them the need that they needed for God's love. And he lived like that the rest of his life after the resurrection. He, he lived as a missionary, and Andrew was well 
was martyred through crucifixion. There was the second group of four. They were uh, very instrumental in the gospel story. There was Philip. Philip made his living fishing like the other four gospel, uh, disciples that we mentioned. When he discovers Jesus, um, he immediately goes and brings Nathaniel to Christ. He doesn't try to coerce or pressure Nathaniel, but with a gentle nudging, he says to Nathaniel, come and see, come and see what I've discovered. And like many of us today, uh, uh, Philip was an expert on how things could not be done. He was a little bit of a cynic. When Jesus said, we have 5,000 people to feed, Philip pulled out his iPhone and <laughs> calculated on his calculator and concluded, there's no way that we can feed 5,000 people. It's impossible. But he had a strong desire to know the Heavenly Father. And, and, uh, but he was, on the other hand, slow to believe. And Jesus had been saying for three years, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. Philip apparently never heard a word he said. And he asked on several occasions, Jesus, show the Father to us. And Christ has to keep saying it over and over. Like many of us, he was slow to act on his faith, but when he did, he became a strong follower of Jesus. And at the end of his life, he too was martyred for his faith in Christ. There's Matthew. Matthew means gift of God. Levi was his name at first, the tax collector who becomes Matthew, a gift of God. Matthew discovered the new life that can be found in Christ. He, he experienced the new covenant of forgiveness. He discovered a cleanliness of heart. And so much so that, that as soon as he discovers Jesus, he prepares a great banquet, a great dinner in his house, and he invites all of his fellow friends and all of his fellow tax collectors to come and meet this man that can change their life. The dinner was so great, the Pharisees said, look, Jesus is eating with sinners. Matthew was also martyred for his faith in Jesus. There was Thomas. Thomas means twin. Thomas comes across as a pessimist and a skeptic. And uh, Thomas comes across as one who challenges everything the teacher says or does. I'm not going to take this on the surface. I'm going to dig. I'm going to research. I'm going to make sure it's logical. I'm going to make sure that, that, that I can understand it. In some crises, though, he displays courage. He, he says to the rest... As soon as Jesus is arrested in the garden, let us go up with him so we may die along with him. But deep within him, there, there was this courageous loyalty that was always unwavering. He was humble and candid enough to be the one many times who would ask Jesus, what did that parable mean? <laughs> I don't understand it. What did that mean? He wants to go deeper. He wants to understand. And, and although we now give him a main title of doubting, we should also see Thomas as the one that's deeply devoted and um, maybe the, the, the somewhat dull disciple who lacks understanding and asks a lot of questions, but therefore gives Jesus many opportunities to disclose the truth more fully to the disciples and to us. And once Thomas understands, once Thomas sees the nail prints in Jesus' hands, he becomes fiercely loyal. There's no turning back. So much so that Thomas was also martyred for his faith in Jesus and what he did for him. There's Nathaniel. Nathaniel means God has given. Nathaniel was from Cana, 
where he witnessed Jesus' first miracle of turning the water into wine. He was brought to Jesus by Philip, and he was initially very leery of Jesus and who he claimed to be. What good can come out of Nazareth, he said. But Jesus loved this young disciple, and, and even right after he said that, uh, Jesus, remember, says, oh, Nathaniel, um, I saw you under the tree. And, and, uh, but he said Nathaniel was one who just had no guile. He didn't say Nathaniel was sinless, but he, he recognized Nathaniel as one who was utterly sincere and enlightened and, and completely dedicated to God. Nathaniel was a good person and stands for the God-fearing good person who, as good as he is, as good as you are, without Jesus, just stands incomplete. Christ made Nathaniel complete. The last four disciples are, are whom we call the four zealots. Simon the zealot is mentioned. He's a member, I guess you could say, of the first PLO group, the Palestinian Liberation Organization. And, and the zealots, even back then, would use many methods, in, including murder, to get rid of the Romans and restore the land to the Jews. And the incredible thing about Jesus' group is that if Matthew and Simon, Peter, would have met anywhere else, Simon would have slit Matthew's throat without batting an eye. But two of them in the presence of Jesus, almost two of them in the same church, things changed. And Matthew and Simon become brothers. A man, Simon, who was eaten up with hating, ended up loving because of Christ. Simon became the leader of the Jerusalem church after James was killed. But in the end, he too would die a martyr's death. There's James, the son of Alphaeus. He's Matthew's brother, and what a contrast. One, a tax collector for the Romans and worked in cahoots with them, and the other who tried to kill the Romans. I'm sure they had some great Thanksgiving dinners together. And maybe these brothers hated each other, but when they both meet Jesus, they're reconciled by his love. One disciple we don't know a lot about, Thaddeus, sometimes in the gospel he's called Judas, son of James. All we know is that he is a zealot. We find out that he was not satisfied with the way Jesus was revealing his power, and Jesus tells him the only thing he needs to worry about is to love him and obey him. We could probably take good teaching like that, too. And then, of course, there's Judas Iscariot, the scapegoat of all humanity. But he was more probably like us than some of us want to confess. He was the only Judean among the twelve, and Judas may have been the best of the uh, best educated apostle there was. They trusted him, the others, and respected him enough, they made him the treasurer. Uh-oh, watch out, Nelson. <laughs> he was potentially, they saw him, gifted to be a great leader in the church to come, and, and we have reason to include him among the zealots. Judas wanted Jesus to be his kind of Messiah, his kind of leader, his kind of Lord that answered to his prayers and to set up his type of empire. He tried to make Jesus the Lord of his convenience and, and how many of us have committed the same sin? We love Jesus as long as he does and wants to be who we want him to be. Judas may have even respected and loved Jesus in, in an unusual way when his plan to make Jesus show his power didn't work. He couldn't take it. Like Peter, he could never, unlike Peter, he could never be forgiven. He commits suicide. Judas was troubled, like some of us. He was troubled by the love of money and jealousy and the lust for power. 
He was tempted by Satan and tragically opened his mind and soul up to the evil in this world that he could never overcome. But Jesus loved him right down to the end, even as he walked towards the darkness. Well, these were the men who Jesus chose. And Jesus tells us in the 15th chapter of John, you did not choose me, but I chose you. And for all of us here, after listening to what these guys and who these guys were, I hope that all of us here who thought that we were smart enough to discover Jesus, it's really Jesus who finds us and saves us. It's Jesus who seeks us out, who seeks out those who are lost, who calls us to follow him. He gives us a mission and he gives us power to accomplishment. And the call is a gentle follow me and it's a choice whether we follow or not. Eleven of these twelve did and the Bible says they turned the world upside down for God. They're no different than you and I. They just allowed themselves to be used and strengthened and be a vessel of the power of the Holy Spirit. And God did great things through them. This group of men teaches us several things. That Jesus pursues and chooses us, not the other way around. We talk a lot about um, asking Jesus. We do need to ask Jesus in our heart or discovering Jesus or I'm trying to figure out who he is. Jesus lets us know who he is. It's his grace. It's, it's the prodigal son. We run towards the father. But the father is always looking out for us. It shows us that, that Jesus has a plan and a place for us in his kingdom work. And I really think if we haven't found that place and we're not working in that kingdom, um, Christ's kingdom's not coming into how it needs to be because he needs each one of us to be finding our gift, our talent, our place, and working. It reminds us that every Christian, everyone can do great things for God because it's God that does it through us, not we who do it ourselves. And his choosing of the 12 also reminds us that every believer is commanded to share and invite others to meet Jesus. Most every one of these disciples who would become apostles, I'm sure every one of them didn't have the great gift of evangelism that rolled off their tongue, but they all loved Jesus so much they drew others to the cross, and we need to do the same. And I think, and I heard you say, um, especially on this Memorial Day weekend, we've had great men and women who have given their life for their country. These, these 11, most all of them, gave their life that we may be sitting here and know Jesus this morning. They gave their life for the sake of Christ. Let's be thankful to God for them. So Jesus, that was the first 12. Since then, he's called millions. <laughs> he's called you. What level of apostle are you this morning? What is Jesus asking you to do? Great for him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for calling us, for never stopping the call, for um, just uh, wanting us to, to, um, to be closer to you and to teach us, but also that we are your instruments, we are your body. Help us to live up to what you're asking us to do. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.